evening and welcome to this Psychology CPD webinar, this one titled Fresh Ideas for Teaching Aggression in Year 2 A-Level Psychology. So to start with, uh, just as a quick overview, the aim of this webinar is really just to have a sort of brief overview of the specification, looking at the possible exam and essay questions that could come up, and then look at some of the examiner commentary and use this from the old exams to see what areas we can avoid uh, tripping up on uh, when teaching the aggression topic. And then we'll look at some ideas for teaching aggression. So I've got four potential activities that you may want to try in your lessons that you can take away from this webinar uh, and try it free of charge. So let's start by having a look at the specification as an overview. Uh, so the aggression specification is actually broken into five key points. You have the neural and hormonal mechanisms first, and there are key ones named uh, and points that you need to sort of be aware of. So limbic system, serotonin, testosterone, and gen genetic factors, including the MAOA gene. You've then got ethological explanations, which includes the evolutionary explanations and key terms, innate releasing mechanisms and fixed action patterns. Really interesting topic there. You've then got social psychological explanations, looking at the frustration aggression hypothesis, social learning theory and de-individuation. Uh, so three key points within that. You've got the idea of institutional aggression, looking at dispositional and situational explanations and then media influences. And again, with three key terms in media influences. So you've got desensitization, disinhibition and cognitive priming. So it's a brief overview. I'm sure you're aware of that already, but just in case you've not got it, just on one slide for you there. It's always interesting, I find, to just have a look through the possible exam questions. Now, obviously, being a new linear exam, we have no idea what the exams will actually look like in uh, June 2017, but we can start to get a picture by looking at the sample assessment material. So we're quite lucky that AQA have released three sample assessment papers. Uh, and what I've done here for you is break them down into the rows of each point of the specification. So the first row shows the potential questions for neural and hormonal mechanisms. The second row shows the different questions for ethological, third social psychological fourth institutional and fifth media aggression to see so you can start sorry media influences to see so you can start to see the types of questions they asked obviously we have no idea what the real paper will look like but this will give you a flavor for some of the questions that they could ask you what also comes out and I've provided two more on the screen for you there is there is the chance for them to embed research methods quite easily into the aggression topic as all the other topics so there's potential uh, potential research method questions that could come up as well what I've done for you, which I think is probably more useful though, is I've put on one Word document the 17 potential essay questions uh, that could come up in this topic. And I've taken those from exam pro textbooks and uh, the sample assessment material just to give you an overview of the different types of questions that could come up for each of the different topics. And you might want to watch out for social psychological explanations and neural uh, and hormonal mechanisms because there seems to be more in those because there's different, different potential questions they could ask, whether it's genetic or neural uh, and within social psychological uh, whether it's social learning theory or uh, explanations around de-individuation. So just watch out for those areas because they are bigger. Now, what I think is really useful is what we can do, which is really handy, is go back and look at the examiner commentary to different questions that have occurred in the past to look at the errors that students have historically made in different questions. And we're really lucky to have five different questions that we can look at to work out what we should avoid doing when teaching the aggression topic. And I've put the five on screen for you there. Now the first one, discuss genetic factors involved in aggressive behaviour. Uh, there's loads of key points that we can pick out from the examiner commentary and I've really summarised it for you just so you can take the key points away. So the examiner said that genetic approaches often implicate neurotransmitters. Uh, but what students typically do or struggle with is making sure that their answer is actually a genetic answer and not an answer about different neurotransmitters. Uh, um, students that focus only on neurotransmission uh, cannot earn any marks in the question because they must be able to link it back to genetic explanations uh, and genes and inheritance. However, if there is a general link made between neurotransmitters and genes, it doesn't need to be detailed for them to get the full range of marks, which is encouraging. So students just need to be able to link their knowledge of genetic explanations, especially if it involves neurotransmission, back to the question. Um, this has always been the case, and this occurs in different topics as well as aggression. It occurs in eating behaviours as well. Um, in terms of evaluation, students like to use MZ and DZ twins, but they often get really confused at why you use MZ and DZ twins and often provide really inaccurate information. So students need to understand concordance rates explicitly to be able to use that to support this particular question and have an activity designed around that later, which hopefully you'll find useful. On to the second question, so discuss evolutionary explanations of human aggression. 
And again, uh, Examiner provides us with a wealth of commentary. Uh, they said straight away that mid-range answers typically fail to sustain focus on aggression. And this is again the case in other topics. So whenever evolutionary explanations come up, uh, I saw in eating behaviours last year, students typically struggle to link evolutionary theory back to the topic you're teaching. So therefore we need to be able to get our students thinking about how evolution actually links to being aggressive. Okay. They also referred to the exam and said they also referred to research studies on things like jealousy and infidelity, but again without drawing any relevance back to the issue of aggression. So if students are going to use research in the evolutionary topic, they need to be able to link that research back to the question. Really, really important. Um, in terms of evaluation, evaluation about evolution was often generic, so that ties into not being able to link it back to the question. Uh, and many students came out with phrases like the evolutionary approach is reductionist because it doesn't take into account genetic factors, which, as you will all appreciate, is a very weak point, uh, really, really not linking it back and answering the question there. So some points to keep in mind there. On to our third question, so discuss the role of neural and or hormonal mechanisms in aggression. Um, it says there straight away the, uh, the examiner said only a minority of students actually earned reasonable AO1 marks. The students clearly struggle with this, okay? Uh, candidates presented answers on genetics that were not relevant to the question. So we've got the opposite problem to earlier. So when it comes to neural and hormonal mechanisms, students are using genetics in their answer but getting really confused there. Um, and typical answers consisted of simply naming a hormonal part of the brain, okay? What I like about examiner commentary is it often gives you an insight into how that students can improve. So the examiner said there needs to be some elaboration, for example, the origins and the general role of testosterone, or the, an outline of the structures that make up the limbic system and their involvement in behaviour. So this is where the elaboration can come from. So it's really clear that three areas within biological, unfortunately, so genetics, neural and hormonal mechanisms, an area that students really really confuse and therefore I think dedicated time needs to go to each of these explanations and students need to be really clear about the individual explanations uh, before they even try and tackle a question on this so really really important things we can learn from that just two more so the fourth question outline and evaluate one social psychological theory of aggression uh, no points on the knowledge here so students were obviously okay with the knowledge uh, but then we get an issue with evaluation which is not uncommon uh, and, and not unsurprising either so unsurprisingly, students will use the Bobo Dole experiment to evaluate social learning theory. Uh, the problem I find that when students know a study particularly well, what can happen is they spend ages and ages discussing that study, talking about the aim, the method, the results and the conclusion, when actually in this particular question, the study is being used to evaluate a social psychological theory of aggression and therefore the students don't need to be providing a really in-depth overview of Bandura's study in the aim, the method, the results, conclusion. What they need to be doing is saying how or why Bandura's study does or doesn't support a psychological theory of aggression. Okay, uh, So they need to make that, again, that explicit link back to the question. Okay, And just steer your students away from, just because they know a lot about the study doesn't mean we want to read a lot about it if it's not answering the question. Okay. Um, and I've put there on the on, on the screen for you, the question is how do the points they make in evaluation actually affect the degree of support there is for social learning theory, okay? On to our final point, and this really is similar to the last one. So the fifth question that we can learn something about, discuss explanations of institutional aggression. Uh, again, we get a similar problem with the Zimbardo study that many students will want to use Zimbardo uh, as, an, as a sort of explanation of institutional aggression. Okay, which is is fine, it can be fine, but the problem is again they go into way too many details about the sort of aim, the method, the results, the conclusion without actually linking it back to the question and more importantly the explanations of situational factors versus de-individuation. Uh, and that's quite hard to do but the students need to sort of practice that skill because they can't just get into the habit of writing loads of details about the study if it's not answering the question because it's not credit worthy. So there we have it, five questions. I think it's always interesting as a sort of exercise to work your way backwards through the examiner reports to look at where a student's going to trip up to inform our teaching and our understanding. Okay. Now, with that in mind, um, that brings us to sort of some top tips for these particular areas, okay? So students need to focus on the knowledge and understanding of genetic and neural explanations. Neural mechanisms must be elaborated, so how does specific brain regions actually affect the behaviour? And in terms of evolutionary explanations and theories, they need to be able to apply their knowledge back to the question. So if they mention sexual jealousy, aggressive behaviour, those need to be applied back to the question. In terms of evaluation, they need to be able to develop their knowledge and understanding and evaluation of twin studies and know how and why to use them. And avoid writing detailed summaries of famous studies like Zimbardo, Bandura. Uh, and if they do want to start giving methodological criticisms of this research, it has to be linked to the study and or the theory. And that's really, really important. 
So there we have it. So there's some top tips in terms of the specification. Uh, we're going to go on to now looking at some of the activities involved that might help overcome some of those issues. So the first activity we're going to look at is one called aggression in 2016. Um, and this is really to overcome this problem that mid-range answers failed to sustain focus on aggression uh, and referred to research without drawing relevance to the issue of aggression. So it's a really simple activity but should be one that's quite effective and the aim of it really is to help students understand why aggression was an adaptive behaviour for our ancestors and whether or not this behaviour is still relevant in 2016. Hence the title, Aggression in 2016. So the way it works is that students are provided with an evolutionary problem. Um, and for each evolutionary problem, the student needs to explain it. So I've given you one here, and this isn't a perfect example. Uh, the purpose of this really is to get the students discussing and to go beyond this. Um, so the evolutionary problem in this case is one issue that our Mao ancestors faced is the issue of parental uncertainty. Uh, and when they need to explain that. So the issue would have been it was impossible for our Mao ancestors to know whether or not the partner was bearing their child or not. The next stage is that the students then need to explain why aggression was an adaptive behaviour for our ancestors living tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years ago. So the argument here would be that aggressive behaviour was adaptive for potentially two different reasons. Firstly, it could potentially deter other males from attempting to mate with their partner. And secondly, it could threaten the females uh, and ideally or hopefully lead to them becoming more faithful not that that's right morally and certainly not right now but that was an argument for why aggression could have existed uh, for our evolutionary past the final sort of aim of this activity is that the students then need to say well is aggressive behavior still adaptive in 2016 and the answer there could be well actually it's of course no longer adaptive because technology enables men uh, and enables men to ensure that they're a parent of their offspring so therefore we shouldn't really see aggressive behavior anymore because it's no longer an adaptive behavior could be an argument as I say, that's a very, very basic outline, but the idea is to get your students discussing, and I would use that one as a modelling example. The handout then provides a series of two other additional problems and the space for them to write their own. Uh, so you've got the problem of sexual competition and the problem of evolutionary warfare, okay, or warfare, attracting females through warfare. And then I've provided space for the students to see if they can think of their own fourth one. The idea of the activity really is to develop their knowledge of evolutionary explanations, but do refer back to this handout when it comes to the evaluation part, because that's really important as well, because there was an issue with linking back the evaluation for evolutionary explanations also. So there's your first activity. Activity two, the purpose of it really, really is to overcome this issue uh, with the use of twin studies. Uh, so we remember back earlier that the examiner said that monozygotic and dizygotic twin studies are often popular, but the rationale was confused and sometimes inaccurate. So the whole purpose of this activity is to get students to understand what concordance rates actually show and then evaluate the effectiveness of concordance rates uh, and of twin studies in particular. The first thing that's really important and worth noting is that students actually need to understand what concordance rates are. And I found a table online that I've always found really, really useful when teaching about twin studies because actually if students can just remember, remember two different points, then they can interpret twin studies. And I think that's what's really important. Um, you've got a table on screen there. The two that I'd refer to are the bottom two. Okay, So if the concordance rates of MZ and DZ twins are similar, that means we can say that the behaviour is partly caused by the environment or more likely to be caused by nurture. Okay? If, however, there is a significant difference, and this is the bottom row, uh, between MZ and DZ concordance rates, that means the behaviour is partly attributed to nature and its genetics. That's the argument anyway. If students don't understand that, simply they just need to learn those two particular differences because that will help them get their head around concordance rates when it comes to actually talking about research. Then what I've done is provided you with two handouts. The, the difficulty with twin studies, I find, is that students are actually using part of the twin study for their knowledge, but then evaluating the twin study also. And I think there's this blurred or this confusion, blurred line, in, as to which bit's my knowledge and which bit's my evaluation. Students often struggle with that. So the idea of this handout is to get them to really separate what could be their knowledge part from what could be their evaluation. And in reality, actually, with holistic marking, this becomes less of an issue, but students do need to know, am I explaining what the finding's showing, and am I now evaluating? Evaluating. So I've given you a study here, Kakaro compared monozygotic and dizygotic twin pairs and in the study they found that twin pairs were examined for concordance rates for criminal behaviour and they found that a 50% concordance rates in MZ twins versus a 19% concordance rate in DZ twins. Now if we just go back to the table, even if students don't understand what a concordance rate is, you can see that the MZ rate was significantly higher than the DZ rate, that's the bottom row, and therefore we can argue that the behaviour is partly attributed to nature, is more likely to be caused by genetics. Okay. So what you can then get the students to do is kind of 
complete the rest of the knowledge section. So they can say, well, therefore, this suggests uh, that criminal behaviour, which is what's mentioned in this case, is caused by genes because the MZ concordance rate was higher. And they carry on. They can then say, well, this can't be explained by the environment because MZ twins had a much higher concordance rate. So they're just simply stating the facts at this point. And therefore, we can conclude that on the basis of Kokaro, that there's a good chance that criminal behaviour is, is attributed to genes. So they've not had to really demonstrate any more knowledge than what's on that previous slide at this stage, okay? Then it comes into the evaluation, which is really interesting with twin studies, because they could say a problem with twin studies is the assumption that MZ and DZ twins share similar environments. They then bring in some examples or evidence, and there's a whole host of sort of theory and research that says, well, actually, MZ twins are treated uh, more similar than DZ twins, and that could account for the similarity. And then they then need to say why that matters, but linking it back to the question. And therefore, this matters that actually the, it may not be that genes are causing the criminal behaviour, which is what the question was asking. It could be that actually it's the shared environment and the more similar environment there is. And therefore, we don't know on the basis of this particular study that genes actually cause uh, aggr uh, aggressive or criminal behaviour in this particular case. I've then provided you with a second study. Uh, so I found one where the actual MZ and DZ rates were really, really similar deliberately so that this time around we can actually say it's more likely to be the result of nurture and the environment. Okay, so same process but just a different study. And hopefully that practice will really help overcome that particular problem. Okay, on to activity three. I've called it an aggressive experiment. Uh, I'm sure you've probably run this already, but a great activity if you've not done it before. And the aim of this activity really is to conduct an in-class replication of Dodd's experiment, while also providing a bit of an opportunity to embed research methodology along the way. Um, important that you don't tell your students the purpose of this activity before uh, actually launching it, otherwise you're going to get all sorts of issues and demand characteristics set in. So the, the handouts, print them off separately. The first handout you'll see, the idea is that you get the students and give them some considerable time to do this. You get the students to answer the, the following question. So if you could do anything humanely possible with the complete assurance that you wouldn't be detected or held responsible, what would you do? And let them write what they want. Tell them it's going to remain anonymous because that's obviously important for ethical reasons as well. Once the students have done that, you should then take them back off the students, completely mix them up. And if you've got different classes, even better, give them to a different class uh, and give them back out to the students. And the idea is for the second part that the students are then going to conduct their own content analysis, OK, uh, thematic analysis on the responses. OK, and you can help them and assist them with this if you want or leave it completely open ended. There's a table on the handout. You could give them some starting points like violent behaviour, stealing or helping behaviour. And the idea is they're just going to simply tally how many times the response, that the, the answer so they've got in front of them has mentioned those categories or referred to those different categories okay two different ways at this point I would probably at this point open out for an in-class discussion uh, and tally all of the answers on, on sort of the main whiteboard uh, just to collect data and have a giant summary on the whiteboard or if you've got a big class you could get them to do it in groups the activity finishes off with them then plotting all of that data, trying to plot it onto sort of a bar chart, which then gives you sort of a nice in-class discussion about do their results support or refute Dodd's original work, which is quite an interesting discussion point. So a lovely activity just to sort of run a really experiment while embedding content analysis into your lessons. The, the final activity, uh, really, really simple activity, uh, activity for situational versus dispositional, uh, because this came up again in one of the, the commentaries that pe people often use Zimbardo's experiment for institutional ingression, but actually it's more important to talk about the factors, the importation model, which is a dispositional factor, or the deprivation model, which is a situational factor. And the idea is that you provide the students with a list of bullet points that you can see on the, in the middle of the screen, and the students have to assign those to whether it's a dispositional factor or a situational factor. And then if they can, can consider how that might apply to Zimbardo's research and actually apply the theory to the research this time and do it the other way around. It's a nice simple activity. Um, just so you're aware, all of our aggression study notes that form part of our optional topic companion are already available on the TutorT website. Uh, so your students can actually access all of the study notes free of charge on the TutorT website. If you like those and you want them in colour with pictures as well, you can. There is an option to buy a site license for your students at priced at just thirty pounds, which you can then print them off and do what you want with them for your students. As always, the resources are all available on our website now. And if you've ever got any further questions, feel free to follow it up via social media, either in our Facebook group or via Twitter, or if need to be directly email me the email address that's on the screen there hope you enjoyed that hope that's given you some food for thought and i'll see you in a webinar soon